Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring, praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring, praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted
Good morning, church. It's an exciting morning and fun to hear all the voices and everybody's fellowshipping together and looking forward to uh, doing the same after the service. One thing that I really, really value of this church is the, the emphasis that we put on the word. Nothing more, nothing less. It is what it is, and I have the privilege of reading this morning um, from 1 Corinthians 12. It's on page 959 in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, but unto your name give glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. And I'm thankful for that truth this morning and I would ask you to stand with me, stand with us, and we'll sing about these truths. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises as your people declare your mighty works. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Father of mercy, be exalted. May Jesus' name be lifted high, for the sacrifice of love has won my pardon, and his resurrection power gives me life. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord. song we sing may be unfamiliar to some of you and maybe you're wondering what the cleft of the rock is I believe that this song is originates from
the passage of in Exodus chapter 33 where Moses is wanting to discuss things with the Lord on a little closer level. He wants to see God. And God says, no, you can't do that. He says, but, but I will hide you in the cleft of this rock over here. And when I pass by, I will put my hand over you and we will be able to communicate. Because he said, if you seek my face, you will die. The glorious God that we serve cannot be looked upon by mankind at this point. And Jesus came to show us the way. He came to show us who the Father was. And in that sense, we haven't seen him either. But those who walked with Christ on the days that he walked in the earth, on the earth, they saw him. But we have him in our hearts. And if we have him, we know who the Father is. And I trust that this song, I hope that this song is your prayer and your life story as well. That God hides us in the, in the, in the, not, in the palm, not only in the palm of his hand does he carry us, but he also hides us and keeps us when troubles come upon us and when we just need that extra touch from God. So let's, let's sing this song, He Hideth My Soul. Depth of his 
be seated. I'll invite the ushers to come forward at this time. We're going to receive our morning's offering this morning, um, but I just wanted to say before we do that, that we have this time of offering as the opportunity for us as a body to contribute financially to the work that God's doing around our community, as well as the work that he's doing through our various missions that we support. But that being said, if it's your first morning here, if it's your first time here or if you're just visiting, I just want to let you know that there's no pressure, there's no responsibility from you to give in this way. So just please contribute as you feel led. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, I just thank you um, yeah, just for the abundance of reminders, Lord, of who you are this morning, who you are to us forever, God, that you are a good God, you are faithful, you are loving, you are protective of us. Um, God, just as we take up this offering, I just ask that uh, we would just be open and willing to give whatever it is that you're asking of us this morning, God, that we uh, wouldn't have a preconceived idea of what we need to give, uh, but that we would just be listening to you, Lord, for what it is that you want us to offer up to you, uh, whether, whether that's anything, God, money or time or just freedom in our scheduling or, Lord, whatever it is that we hold on tightly to, uh, yeah, I just pray for release over those things this morning. Bless this offering, God, and the missions and the various works around our community that it will support. And, yeah, we just thank you, Lord, for who you are. Amen. We're going to sing, uh, I believe, in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'm going to sing it for you, with you. If you want to join me in the chorus... I would invite you to do that. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sand that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross I believe that the Christ who was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today for he changed me completely a new life is mine that is why by the cross I will stay. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that this life with its great mysteries surely someday will come to an end. But faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead at last to my friend I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I'll believe whatever the cost and when time has surrendered and earth is no more 
I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. Good morning, church. My name is John. I'm one of the elders here in the church. And, uh, Along with Jen, I appreciate our dedication to the Word, but also I, I, we look at a Sunday in our worship teams, and I also appreciate just the variety of worship that we are allowed to do between some hymns that are 200 years old to more contemporary music that is brand new. So I, I really appreciate that about our church as well. Um, as is our accustomed to, we're, we had our elders meeting this uh, last Tuesday, and so there's a couple of things we'd just like to communicate to you um, from that meeting. So the basement is complete, and it looks great, so that's, a, that's very exciting. Uh, special thanks to Leonard LeSerf, Al West, Brian Kuhn, and Grant Kleiber for their willingness to be a part of the building committee. Um, so we've been meeting, well, longer than we expected, but... Uh, our last meeting should be tomorrow, so and we should be able to kind of be done after that. Uh, <laughs> I'd also like to give a huge thanks to Matt Vima, MB Contracting. Um, building projects are never easy, and this one was no different. Uh, but Matt did a great job persevering through, and the end result is a beautiful basement we'll be able to enjoy for many years to come. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, the other thing we discussed that we want to communicate is the praise banquet, which is happening October 20th, so about a month from now. As in previous years, we'd like the first portion that uh, we collect through the praise banquet to go to some organizations outside of our church, um, and ones that we, we've been dealing with for many years. So. What we've proposed is that the first $12,000 would be split evenly between three different ministries, the Pregnancy Care, Mexico Mission, and our Malaysia Mission. Uh, the next amount, um, between over $12,000, between $12,000 and $47,000, um, we have decided to put towards a new projector. Um, for those of you that don't know, our projector is quickly deteriorating and soon won't even have enough clarity to show the simplest of slides. So we've checked into having it fixed, and the cost isn't quite worth it, so we've decided to replace it. So if, uh, if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff after uh, church, contact one of the elders, um, or if you want more clarification, or one of the pastors. So, um, And then anything above that $47,000 will go against the basement uh, debt that we'll have now so if there's any again if there's any questions please let us know uh, and then before I go into pastoral prayer, prayer I'd just like to bring to your attention a couple of exciting changes taking place in the near future um, we've revamped our Sunday school for both kids and adults and we're looking forward to the opportunity to discuss and gain knowledge we feel all of us should have as Christians growing in our faith the group sizes will be smaller for the adults, so we really hope this will also give us a chance to meet and connect with people in our church we don't normally have the opportunity to do. The other ongoing ministry that we've heard about, and it's been ongoing since about the spring, is uh, the Bright Lights, which is a program that happens for the younger kids during our service that lets them learn alongside what's being talked about in the service. So this is a great time, and it's exciting now that we've finished the basement and we're kind of focused and ready to start all these new ministries. Um, and 
If you're wondering, Sunday school or a new ramp, Sunday school starts October 6th. Again, any questions, just come speak to us. So, Now if you'll join me in prayer. <clears throat> Dearly Father, what a comfort it is to know that you will never leave us or forsake us. We will all go through times like Paul did when we are in need or have plenty. Please help us to find peace and contentment in you. I'd like to pray specifically for the people in our congregation that are hurting or struggling with either physical, emotional, spiritual, or financial issues, Lord. I pray that they would look to you for all that they need, and at the same time, I pray as we as a congregation would come alongside them and give them the support that they need. I also want to pray for our election that's coming up, Lord. I pray for good leaders that are morally sound and who will ultimately love and fear you. Lastly, Lord, I'd like to thank you for bringing our church through this time of renovation, both in physical sense with our basement, but also in our own personal lives. We've had a break from our normal routines and here at, here at our church and have our, our opportunities have changed with the new programs that are starting. I pray, Lord, this is a great and exciting time for our church's life, where we will see new and old lives focused on serving you and others for your glory. Now as Mike comes, please fill him with your spirit as he speaks and help us to listen and retain and put into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. Check. There we go. Ooh. See, too much of me is a bad thing. So, <laughs> anyways, it's good to be here this morning. I am Pastor Mike, and uh, it's a pleasure to be preaching this morning to you. Uh, I just want to say a, a welcome to those that are new with us this morning. Maybe you've come just for the barbecue. Maybe you're checking out the church or whatever it might be. But I just want to say welcome here, and I hope that you have a good time. Um, in the service afterwards and uh, if you have come with little kids like babies or toddlers and you need to during the service step out for a little bit we do have a room at the back there's some windows there you can still be connected by um, listening to the sermon there and being able to see it as well um, so if you need to use that room please leave if you need uh, that's available to you well today uh, if you have your Bibles please turn to 1st Corinthians chapter 12 and if you want to borrow a Bible today, it's on page 959. We've already read from there this morning, and we are going to revisit it. Um, and if you don't have a Bible at all, you can always ask for one at our welcome desk just outside the doors, and we would love to be able to give you one before you leave today. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And as you turn there, I just want to remind us that last week we began a series called What is the Church? And we did this to remind ourselves who God has made us to be and what God intends to do through us. And I started by telling a story, one that I think will never be forgotten, if you were here, where I cut down a tree with only a hammer and a screwdriver. And I want to say thank you, by the way, to those that offered me a saw and said <laughs> over this last week, and a special thank you to the one who bought me a saw and just gave it to me. Um, the point was, though, that things are made for a specific purpose. And when you use things for a different purpose than what they were designed for, things can go terribly wrong. They can go not at all as you planned, and they can cause a lot of damage. And so it is with the church. And that's sort of the idea, the, the logic that we want to use as we look at the church. What was the church intended for, and how should it be used in our lives? Or how should we fit into it, and what should we be trying to accomplish? Because I think there's been people who have tried to use the church in a way that it was never intended to be used, and they end up hurt or disappointed or much worse. And so as we look at what the church is, we want to remind ourselves that God has designed it for a purpose. So if we know what that purpose is and how it is we are to accomplish that, this will help all of us as individuals, but also all of us as one church. And so just so we're all on the same page, I want to highlight a few things that we, that we saw last week, which was what every single one of us as a Christian has in common. We saw that every single Christian was guilty of sin and destined to endure God's eternal punishment. 
We saw that. But the way we've become Christians is exactly the same way, that God, in His mercy and grace and love, has saved us through His Son by His life and His death. And this, what he did for us, was earn our forgiveness and earn our eternal life for us. And so it's by grace that we have been saved. But more than just forgiveness, we have been saved and now united to Christ so that he lives in us and we live in him. And because we're all united to the same person that is Christ, we are all, as individuals, united to one another. And so what we, what we saw was that the church is less of a what and more of a who. Who is the church? And that's our starting point for today. What we all had in common was what we looked at last week. And when we rely on Christ, we will do, we will become what God wants for us to become. But before we move on, I want to say this, just so that we're all clear. I think it's a good reminder for us to know that the Christian that deserves to be in the church doesn't exist. Because every single one of us has been saved by grace, through faith in Christ. So that we don't boast in ourselves, our work, our efforts, our accomplishments. We only can boast in what God has done for us. And so I want to say this at the outset. That anyone here who's been coming to church to make themselves good enough to be acceptable before God. Or maybe you're not going to church, but you're still trying and working through your life, trying to be acceptable to God, to earn forgiveness, to earn eternal life, to earn God's approval. It, it won't work. And the good news that the church is built on is the fact that because we can't do it, and because God is so loving towards us, He has done it for us. By living and dying to earn what it is that we need to be saved. And so we rely on Jesus' work, not our own, and we are all saved by grace. And if that's you this morning, that you realize this, and you put your faith in Christ, trusting in what He has done for you, you, like the rest of us, will be saved by grace. And this relying upon God doesn't stop after we're saved. It continues on. And we constantly trust that God is going to work in us to help us fulfill what it is that he's created us to be. And as each individual Christian now lives by the Spirit of God working inside of us, we are now trying to live this out. And as we gather together, we make up what is referred to as the church. And by the Spirit working in individuals, he works through all of us as the church as if the presence of God were with us and in the world. It's, as, it's like Jesus never left. And that's why the church is often referred to as the body of Christ himself. But this kind of living, this kind of church functioning out this way perfectly doesn't happen automatically, does it? I'm sure you've, you've never found that church that does it perfectly. And this includes Strathmore Alliance. In the way that we live, live this out, we still struggle with sin, we still are working at this, and we still need to rely upon God's help to do this properly. And so today we're going to look at a biblical case study in which a church was dividing and floundering in the way that they were supposed to function. And I hope and I, I pray that we will see God's divine design for the people of God so that we will function the way as a body is supposed to function. And by doing so, we will fulfill the, the purpose that God has, that we would be Christ in the world. And so this first letter to the Corinthians that we're going to look at was sent to a church with many glaring problems. And so the writer, Paul, he's writing to this church and he's responding to a variety of issues that needed to be addressed. And as you read through 1 Corinthians, you'll notice that he, it sounds like they sent him a letter asking a whole bunch of different church questions. What about this? What about that? And when we get to chapter 7, you don't need to turn there, but it starts by saying this, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And then he goes into those things. He, he talks about a variety of things, and he pastorally replies to their church questions. He talks about the married people, how they are supposed to live, how the unmarried are supposed to live, and the widows. He talks about if there's certain foods that they should avoid and, and how to eat the Lord's Supper together. Because if they were not biblically informed by Paul, then they would continue to be dividing rather than caring for one another. You can imagine the kind of quarrels that were happening in Corinth. 
maybe quarrels that you've seen in churches in your own life. One of the issues that had arisen in this church was the fact that they were trying to decide or trying to figure out who was more spiritual than the other ones. Who was truly spiritual when some looked like they were and some looked like they weren't. And what they had done was they invented a a system, uh, almost like a hierarchy of what is more spiritual and what is less spiritual. And they would ask questions like, like, who was it that baptized you? Because that's important. Or who, which preacher do you listen to the most? And when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tackles this idea. And that's where I want to sit this morning. And he says this in verse 1 of chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts. And this could also be translated as spiritual people or spiritual things. And it's here that we find most clearly this idea that we are to function as the body of Christ. And before we get to that, let's not think that because our church doesn't have the same sorts of outrageous problems that this church had, that we couldn't get there. It's possible for us to get there. And, and let's not trick ourselves into believing that we don't have any problems until they're unavoidably obvious. And by starting last week, the reminder to us was that every single one of us was equally dead in sin. And every single one of us needed an equal amount of the grace of God to be made alive and then all equally united to Christ. And therefore the church is one. We are one and we'll see that that means we are one body. And Ephesians chapter 4 says that we have one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all. And so there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And so if this is true, then any claim that people, maybe you've heard these things where there's, there's, there's two steps or, or two classes of Christians, which one are you in? Or there's three steps to be fully in Christ. Have you taken those steps? All of those kinds of things are man-made. That's not how it works in the church. And God's people are one because his plan for the church was to unite them all in one, that is, in Christ. So we've seen that. That's our starting point for today. And so what we're going to look at today is how it is that when you look around this room, we are almost infinitely diverse. And you think of the church around the world, how diverse people can be, and yet we're all one family. How does that work? How, how is that even possible how are we to live as one? And the amazing thing is that God has done, that God, what God has done is designed and empowered us to live as one without losing our individuality. And that's, that's encouraging for us. That should be freeing for you. Because in one way, we know that unity is necessary and it's so beneficial for us. But in another way, if, we, if our individuality isn't incorporated into what we are doing and who we are, then doesn't it feel like something is lost? So I want us to see this, that we are one, but we are also diverse. And by the end of this sermon, I hope that you can answer this question, that we all can answer this question, that as believers, where do I, where do you fit into the people of God in the church? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want you to notice how Paul begins. In verse 1, he reminds us that we are a family. And we see that because he calls us brothers, which can also include sisters. And then in verse 2 and 3, it points out that before we were saved, we used to follow our desires and we were led away from God. But now that we've all received the Spirit, we now live by the Spirit and we are led towards God. And by that same Spirit, everyone who's in Christ by faith, whom His Spirit indwells, look at verse 3, it says that we say that Jesus is Lord. And actually, we don't just say it, because anyone can say those words. We believe it, and we live in surrender and submission to a Master, Jesus. We say this, and we believe it. And without the work of God's Spirit, what these verses also tell us is that we'll just curse God and walk away and make gods out of other things. But now that we've been given the Spirit, we now are joyfully willing slaves, the Bible calls us, of Christ. Joyfully willing slaves. And at the outset, then, we're reminded that all those who make up the church 
are characterized by their submission to Jesus. Next, in verses 4 to 11, Paul says that even though we're one, we're not all the same. I want, just, I want you to see how many ways Paul can make this point. Among the people of God, there is a variety within the unity. And that's what we want to look at today. Look at verse 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all. So in God's purpose to unite all believers as one, He doesn't cease to value diversity. You see that. We we don't have to choose, should we be united or should we be diverse? God is wanting both. And this should be that encouragement that you can be you within the oneness of the church. Because in one way we know that we need to be unified, and in another way, diversity is so beneficial. And what God wants to do is use diversity to enhance the unity that we have here. Now keep in mind that the varieties of gifts and service and, and activities are all from the same person. We, the, we have gifts, but they're all from one provider. We have service, but we're all serving the same Lord. And we have activities, and they're all empowered by the same God. And every kind of diversity is a gift of God in the church. We need to see that, I think. We need to remember this. So with this understanding, let's make this more personal for each one of us here. Look at verse 7. It says that to each, so you could say to you, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So now that's all of us here. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There's three things here that we need to understand. First, that God gives His people His Spirit. And not just to hibernate in you or to make little or no difference in your life whatsoever, but to make manifest the Spirit in your, in your life. So, so when you have the Spirit, it's not just so much that you have Him, but that He works in such a way that it's externally evident that you have the Spirit. He animates us to obey what God has called us to do in practical and tangible ways. And then the second thing I see here is that this active Holy Spirit is given specifically to believers. And so if you have faith in Christ today, verse 7 wants to tell you and to remove the doubt that yes, you have received the Spirit. He he doesn't question if anything else has happened. If you are in the church, if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit. And third, verse 7 tells us why you have the Spirit. And it says for the common good. And so the Spirit isn't just in you to benefit you alone, but in you to benefit the whole people of God. That's why you've been given the Spirit. And He's not limited to just one manifestation. If we want to use the term of verse 7, this manifestation, the way that it works, the way that He works is in a variety. Look at verses 8 to 10. There's a variety of examples from wisdom to knowledge, from faith to healing from miracles to discernment and more. So God is not a one-trick pony. He is vastly diverse. Verse 11 makes this point. After giving all these examples, it says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually, how? As He chose, as He wills. So church, we must not limit God by thinking that there's only a certain amount of ways that He can work by His Spirit. That we need to look for certain gifts and activities and service to say that that's the way He works, but this is not the way that He works. And we can't, we, we, we can't forget that God is showing us here that He loves variety. He empowers variety. He distributes variety because He wants variety in His church. This is important for us to understand because before we move on in the rest of this chapter, let's remember where we came from. Back in verse 1, remember that Paul is addressing this idea that some people think that they're more spiritual than other people. And they had invented this system 
about how spiritual you are and kind of find out where you fit within it all. And what they had done is they, they made a system that was based on the diversity, not on the unity. They were looking at the gifts and saying, okay, that seems spiritual, but just having faith, that's, that's not enough. You, ne you need to do these sorts of things, not anything else. And so they were, they were dividing and destroying themselves by basing their, their spirituality on something that was never supposed to be. Instead, the mark of a spiritual person that Paul is saying here is, do you have the Spirit? You are a spiritual person just as much as anyone else if you have the Spirit. And how do we know if we have the Spirit? What we've seen is that you say Jesus is Lord, meaning that you submit yourself to Jesus. This is something that the Spirit, only in the Spirit can we do. That's what Paul said. And the same thing is also true of serving other people. We seek the good of the family of God. Again, something that the Spirit brings about within His people. And so the first point in your outline is that the people of God are many, and we are diverse, but each are Spirit-filled. I know this might not be the normal way of measuring how spiritual a person is. And maybe when you think of your own spirituality, your own Christianity, and you evaluate, so where am I at? And you think, I, I don't do these things. I, I think we're a lot more like the Christians in Corinth than we are the way that the Bible tells us to be. Do you have the Spirit? Then you are spiritual, just as much as anyone else. We often look at the extravagant manifestations of the Spirit, as verse 7 calls them. The extravagant ones, the ones that draw attention, the ones that seem to us more honorable, and we kind of discount the other ones. And so when those people, or we are one of those people, who are ex exhibiting those, those manifestations, we think that we might be more significant than other people in the church. But this is opposite. This is the wrong way to look at it. Paul is saying here is that you're either spiritual or you're not. You either have the Spirit or you don't. And so God inspires diversity among His people, but He does it within the unity of His people. And so we might say that He uses diversity to enhance the unity, but He wants both. So in verse 1, Paul said this, I do not want you to be uninformed. And so what we were supposed to have looked at now was his answer. Now you know what it is, how it works, what you're supposed to do. But he knows that it's not that simple. He knows that, well, it sounds simple, but it's really hard to carry out. And so what he does is he begins to paint a vivid and memorable picture, probably one that we've all heard before because it's so easy to understand. And what he wants us to know is, okay, now this is how it's supposed to work itself out. This is how we are to live. We are supposed to be diverse without division. And so he gives us an image in verse 12. For just as the body, it says, is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And so here we are to begin to think of the church as a body. Maybe you can think about it as your body. So the question is, how many bodies do you have? You have one. How many parts do you have? You have many. And in the same way, the church is made up of many parts, but is all contributing to one body, one unit. And this is, it's really simple. I have a hard time trying to think, how do I preach this without making people feel silly and, and dumb? But it's so helpful to understand. And so I want to I pull this out a little bit. And what he wants us to know is that every Christian has been given the Spirit. And that Spirit works in every individual part of a whole body. And it seems as though that there is a part that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you, but only a part, so that we are necessarily connected, interdependent upon one another. Because you on your own can't be the whole church. We need each other. We, we need to be a church. And so what we see here is that God has sovereignly designed Christians to live this way. Interdependent upon one another. If you'll jump down to verse 29, there's a couple questions there. It says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? 
Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And after this chapter, the answer is no. The answer is no. Not one of us here has all the gifts, but everyone here has a gift. And so the way we, we, we can't just think that, well, I can just go on my own and I don't need you, or I'm not good enough and so I'm, I'm not a part of anything. And that's exactly where we're, where we're going to go next with this. So what we're seeing here is that we're so connected. God has designed us this way that we can't function without other Christians. The church is necessary. So let me say this. If you think that you are better off without the church, God says you're wrong. And if you think that the church is irrelevant or the church is unnecessary in the world, God says that you are wrong. Just like one part doesn't make a body, one Christian doesn't make the church. Next, Paul deals with two sinful attitudes that we will have. A tendency of leaning towards. Maybe you felt one, probably you felt both. And this is just the fact that saved sinners are being put together. And we're still dealing with sin. And we still deal with pride and insecurities. And so he wants to show us how there's two things that we can't do. If this is how the body is supposed to work, we need to guard ourselves from thinking in two ways. And both of them are, are, are are a form of pride. And as long as we have pride, these feelings are going to continue to come and that we need to fight against. So the first one is in verses 15 and 16. This attitude here is one of thinking that the Spirit is working in my life, but He's doing something different in someone else's life. And that's what I want. I wish I was doing that, but because I'm not doing that, I don't belong to the body. Look at what it says. We're to imagine here our foot is now talking. Let's say you overheard your foot saying this, because I am not your hand, I do not belong to your body. Or imagine your ear is talking and it says, because I am not your eye, I do not belong to your body. And to both, Paul says this, even though you feel that way, even though you're thinking that, it doesn't, it wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. So what he's saying is that We feel this way sometimes. And he's recognizing that. That Sometimes we think, I'd I'd like to have that gift. I think that one's better. I wish I could have that. Look at what I'm doing. It's, it's, It's not as significant. It's not as important. At least that's the way we think. But does it take away the fact that we're in the body? I think part of this illustration is to show us, I mean, it's kind of silly that these body parts are talking. And I think the same way, we're supposed to think that it's silly that a foot would say that because, of course, it's part of the body. Of course it is. If, if, if our foot started acting like a hand, I think we'd be more upset than we'd be happy. Or our ear started acting like an eye. Think of driving. What would, what would happen? It, it wouldn't work. It would make our lives worse because we have every part that was designed to do something specifically. The benefits from our ears are invaluable even though they can't see. And our foot, we never blame it for not acting like a hand. And so this is why verse 17 asks, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? You you wouldn't be able to hear. You would lose out on something if this changed. And the second part is, if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So we are designed to all work together. And if we start changing and desiring and wanting and, and living in a way that we weren't designed to live, the whole body of the church begins to lose out. And so it is with the church. When we, be think, when we begin to think that we don't belong because the Spirit's not doing what they're doing in someone else's life, we, we begin to think wrongly about the church, about how it's supposed to work, about what our role is. So every individual Christian equally has the Spirit, but every individual Christian is used by God in uniquely Spirit-led ways. And so verse 18 18 emphasizes the specific way that you contribute to the church is not an accident. Look at verse 18. God arranged the bodies, or the member in the body, each one of them, every single one of us, as He chose. So God put us exactly where we're supposed to be. 
It wasn't an accident. Will, will we trust him that he knows what he's doing? Just as God knit you together in your mother's womb, he is knitting together individual Christians meticulously, every single one, placing them exactly where he wants you to be. Will you trust him? Or do you doubt and try to take control and say, no, I should have been that, or I would have been better if I was that. He says, no, that's not your place. I put you here. I want you here. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, each one of you belong to the church. And each one of you are valuable to the church. And each one of you are unique in the church. So God intends for everyone to serve each other for the common good and to serve in their own unique way. There's unity and there's diversity. So I want you to hear God this morning through these verses say to you, as a child of God, he says to you, you belong. You are, in, you are valuable and you are unique and it's just the way God wanted it. But before we get too, thinking too highly of ourselves because of that message, Paul cautions us against the other way of thinking. The second attitude in verse 21, which is just selfish pride, where we begin to think that we're more than we are. So first we think we're not enough, and now we're going to think we're, 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 we're better off without other people. And it says this, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So, so just because the Spirit is doing something spectacular in your life, you say, wow, I'm, I'm contributing so valuably to the body of Christ, and this other person over here isn't really doing as much as me, that we begin to think that they're unnecessary. They're just everyday, faithful, regular, spiritual person following the Lord and whatever they're doing, and you begin to compare your gifts and your abilities and your activities and your service and saying, we don't need them. Actually, that's not true, because, because we are to consider that sometimes the more mundane is actually more important than the spectacular. Consider this, your hands, you, you use them almost, I'm using them almost all the time, and they're so multifunctional functional, that we have so much use, so much benefit out of our hands. Now consider your heart, it's hidden, unseen. And all it does is thump every day, rhythmically, all the time, doing the exact same thing over and over again. And so the hand begins to think, well, I don't need the heart. It's not, very, it's not really doing much. And yet people can live without a hand. They die without a heart. And so sometimes we need to change the way that we think. And verse 22 points out how the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, and I think it's important that he says seem, we think that they are weaker. It's, they seem to be weaker. They're actually indispensable. That's how God has designed it. He says that there are parts of our body, naturally speaking, that, that are less honorable. And yet, God has designed them that they actually get more honor. So think of something like your eyes. People might say you have beautiful eyes. Nobody says you have beautiful kidneys. <laughs> or liver. Or whatever it is. And yet, we protect our kidneys and liver and inside organs and we, we protect them we guard them and how we live and so we're honoring them they're just not as obvious and so in the way that god has designed the body where there is lacking honor there's more honor actually and it all balances out to the point where we we look at verse 14 or sorry 24 that there's a variety of gifts a variety of activities a varieties of service but because one Spirit, one Lord, one God are all working in it. Verse 24 says, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So where it lacks, he gives more honor. And so it all evens out that there may be no division in the body. And secondly, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So what we're doing here now is we're not just evaluating people on how much they contribute or what they contribute but we see how intricately involved and interdependent we are, that we would say, I got to care for you because I need you. It's so important to, to see that. God has designed the church in, in such a way that 
that all believers have the Spirit and are worked in through the Spirit, but not all in the same way. And there are some gifts, some activities, some service that draws more attention. For example, teachers or musicians or even elders. They draw attention and they might be more honored just by the way that they function. And then there's others that are quite hidden, like people who just pray for our church. And nobody really knows it, but they pray. Or they give generously, and nobody really knows it. Or, or they work in the nursery during the service, and people don't even know they're part of our church because they're faithfully serving down there in a whole variety of ways. But because these are all done in the same spirit, they are valuable, they are indispensable, and they are honorable. God doesn't see these as better or worse as we might. He sees them as equal and necessary. Now, if we don't understand this, we'll divide and destroy ourselves. That's what was happening here in Corinth. That's what's happened in churches a lot over the years. And this is what we need to avoid, and we need to embrace the fact that God has designed this church and all, all of his church to work, to function in a specific way, so as not to divide, but to remain united. And we will begin to, to care for one another. Do you see that in verse 24? We will show the same love and support for the person in the sound booth as the pastor on the stage. We will care equally for the person that shovels the walkway in winter to the, to the, to the elder in our church. We'll care the same for our Bible study leader as the person who cleans the pews after the service. Because whether we think so or not, and that's the problem, the attitude is we think, we evaluate it. No matter what we think, God, it says, has made them indispensable. And the truth is we all are. And if we understand this, we will begin to live like verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Just think of how you stub your toe and your, your whole body focuses on, on caring for that toe. Everything changes within you. And you focus on it. And in the same way, we should focus for those and, and care for those who are hurting in our church when they do. And in the same way, when we receive a compliment about something, it seems that our whole body changes and brightens. And in the same way, when one member is honored, we will all celebrate their honor of, this, of the same body. So brothers and sisters in Christ, each one of you is indispensable. And each one of you is honorable in the church, and each one of you should be supported by one another in the church. Doesn't this chapter of the Bible make you want to find that church and join it? This would be great. I think we should all be desiring this for our own church, and I think we do. But it's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of effort to rely on the Spirit to allow for diversity to enhance our unity. And I think that there are people outside of the church who would see us doing this and say, I want to be a part of that. This is amazing, and only the Spirit of God can bring this about. But unfortunately, we're still sinful people. And we won't deny that we are sinful people still. But we need to remember that so that when we try to carry this out in the church, try to live this way, we won't try to do it in our own strength. This is exactly what the Spirit is given to carry out within his people. And without each of us relying upon God, upon the spirit within us, we will continue to fail to move forward towards this. So what would it take to become a church like this? And this is how I want to end, just asking these questions. What steps could we take to becoming the body of Christ in this way? Well, it begins by remembering that God is behind it all. He, he's in charge. God is the one who saved us by grace. God is the one who has given us his spirit. He's united us to Christ and he's united us to one another. And he's put every single person in its place to function as one. So whenever we think that we're useless because the spirit's not doing a certain thing in our life, we're actually insulting God and the way that he is putting us together. We need to trust his judgment and the way that he works and seek the good of one another, the whole body. Secondly, Becoming a church like this also begins 
with remembering that the Spirit has given, uh, was given to you in order that you might serve one another. Not just serve yourself, to serve the whole body of Christ. We want the Spirit's power, don't we? But we don't want to serve. But that's exactly what the Spirit was given to do. It says in verse 7, The Spirit to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, it says, for the common good. So if you want to obey God by, in the power of the Spirit, He's going to lead you to serve other people. It's for the common good. And we will only be the body of Christ when each member serves in a way that helps the whole body. And so our posture as Christians must be one of service to the point that when we see or hear of a need, whether we're the most gifted at it or not, our question is, how can I help? How can I serve? That's what the Spirit was given to you for. Third, becoming a church like this means that we see one another as equal members of the body of Christ. The person you sit beside on Sunday mornings, whether it changes or not, we're equals within the body. We are all seeking the same purpose. We trust that our service is pleasing to the Lord, no matter how big or small it may seem. And we trust that other people's service is pleasing and necessary no matter how big or small it may seem. And without embracing God's intentions for His people to be interdependent, we won't love and support and care for one another as we ought to, as we need to. Lastly, in fact, the, the, well, let me make one comment here about membership. This is exactly where we get the idea of membership. To be a member of a body, to be committed to serving one another, to, to supporting the ministry, the whole ministry of the church, to submitting to the leaders, to seeking unity. That's what it means to be a member. That's how we see membership. And there are people in this church that have thought about it, but have never become a member. Perhaps they're already living this way. And there are other people who have considered it, but never really understood it. And I hope that this is helpful for you. And what I would ask of you is to really consider becoming a member. And what that would mean for the rest of us as members would be you saying to us, actually, officially, I guess, to say, I'm committed to serving this body of believers in the spirit for the common good. I'm on the team. I'm with you. That, that's so encouraging to the rest of us when there is a new member added. And that's what it's for. To say that this is the body that I'm a part of, that God has put me in, and I want to contribute the way that God has designed me to for the unity of this people. And for the rest of us who are already members, let this picture be a guide for us to help us evaluate how we're doing. And let it motivate us to, to lead us into better ways of serving one another. So the last question I have is, if you're a member of the body of Christ, and you were given the Spirit to serve the common good of God's people, then how is it that you are serving? You, most of us ask, what is the purpose for my life? God says, I gave you the Spirit so that you can serve in His power, in His unique ways. And so the question is, how are you serving? And I don't want to limit God in any way. There is a variety of ways that people can serve. But some options might be in this church, that as we launch our ministries in a couple of weeks, that maybe you want to lead a class of kids and help them understand the gospel. Or maybe you want to snuggle babies and toddlers in the nursery so that the parents can better focus as they worship together. Maybe you want to get involved with the youth group as an adult worth imitating, being a coach or, or, or a, another voice, positive, encouraging voice, a biblical voice in their lives as well. Maybe you want to help with the sound in these services or recording the sermons or some other technical way that you might have skills to be able to help with. Perhaps you know your way around the kitchen and, and you're, you're very good at baking and we have cookies after the service, every service, and uh, they're probably better coming from your oven than the store. And so maybe you want to provide cookies for the services. Or maybe you want to make meals for those that have had surgeries or had babies recently and just need those, the help in that way. Or you might make yourself available to help people move or to clean or, or to do yard work. Whatever it is that you might be able to serve the, the people in this church in a way that is practical, tangible. That's what the Spirit leads to, this tangible outworking. Or maybe you want to pray with people after the service. 
Or maybe you want to give more generously than you have been to support the ministries and missionaries. There is a variety of ways, and don't let this, this list that I just said stop you from thinking of more ways that you can serve. There is a variety of ways that we can serve, but the call to serve is clear. We all are to serve. And perhaps God is nudging you this morning to step out in obedience, and you will begin to experience the joy that He promises to those who serve Him by serving His people. And church, we need you. We need you. And you need us. So in the end, we're all saved to serve. I want to end by saying this, because that's what our Lord did. In Mark chapter 10, it says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And if this is what characterized Jesus' life, your Lord's life, your Savior's life, and He's given us His own Spirit to live within us and make us like Him, then what else would He make us become but servants? And so even at a barbecue, as we're about to enjoy, wherever we find ourselves, brothers and sisters, whatever it is that we are, it is an opportunity to obey God by serving in our own unique way that the Spirit works in our lives. And so if we're to be the church, the question you and I need to ask ourselves constantly and to ask others is, how can I serve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that all of these things that we read in your word, all of these requirements, all of these goals are not to be done in our own strength. That we do have a place our own bodies, we physically have to do these things, but you've given us your spirit to empower us, to lead us, to guide us, to teach us how to do these things. And so I pray that as your church, as the people of God, we would not just focus only on our unity, but we would also be and, and embrace the diversity that you want, to, you want to experience and manifest in our midst. I pray that you would free people to be okay with how you've made them, and not to think that their service is any less important than other people's. I pray also that for those of us that are perhaps in more obvious and honorable positions, that we would not think that we don't need others. But help us, Father, to understand and embrace this divine design for your church. And if we would do that, in the power of your Holy Spirit, this church would, would experience the joy that you promised us as we worship you and witness to the world who it is that you are. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for making us the church. And I pray that we would value it as we see that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so I pray that you would lead us in our spirits to serve in ways that perhaps even scare us, but to know that your spirit is leading and empowering us and that it is all for the same Lord, the glory of God the Father, who is all in all. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The song we're going to sing is a, is a prayer of commitment, and I hope that all of us can say these words, can sing these words. At the very least, they will be a challenge for us, and at the most, we can say, thank you, Lord, for, for putting me into service and using me for your glory. So let's stand and sing Jesus all for Jesus. Surrender these 
into your hands. All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, I surrender these into your hands. For it's all Thank you, Mike. Um, just a couple of reminders. There's prayer after the service, um, and then right after the service, we've got the barbecue, and so it's a great time just to go down and see the basement if you haven't seen it, and just uh, spend some time together. Um, so the benediction today, 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in, his, in its various forms. Uh, let's just pray for the meal this this evening or this afternoon. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, for what's been spoken today, Lord, and I pray that you would help us um, maybe to gain a new realization of what it is and what it means to to serve you and to serve the body. Uh, and I just pray, Lord, that you would give each one of us the encouragement we need to do that. And Lord, I think about our. Uh, lunch today, Lord. I pray that you would just bless this food to our bodies. I pray that you'd bless the conversation, and I too want to thank you just for uh, where, you, where you've brought us to with the basement, and I just, in general, with what we're doing new this fall as well. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>